Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women, who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. So in chapter one, we see that we need to guard the gospel because the gospel is a treasure worth losing everything and even suffering for. In chapter two, we see because the gospel is the key to real life change. Here in chapter three, Paul says to Timothy, guard the gospel because the gospel is easily misunderstood and twisted by false teachers. John Calvin I came across this quote in my research. John Calvin said, we should note that the danger of this time in Paul's view was not war, not famine, not or diseases, nor any other calamities, but the wicked and depraved ways of men. At least 18 different characteristics are listed here in this section. Paul probably could have listed more. And they emphasize that they're all about love but it's all about being lovers of yourself. You know, God commands us to love him supremely and our neighbors as ourselves. But if we love ourselves supremely, we will not love God or our neighbors. Warren Wearsby said this, he said, in this universe, there is God and there are people and there are things. We should worship God, love people and use things. But if we start worshiping ourselves, we ignore God and we start loving things and using people. This is a formula for a miserable life. Yet it characterizes so many people today. The worldwide craving for things is just one evidence that people's hearts have turned away from God. I thought that was pretty insightful. Chapter one is because the gospel is a treasure worth losing everything and suffering for. Chapter two, because the gospel is the key to real life change changing unbelievers to believers, but then changing believers more like to become more like Christ. And then chapter three, because the gospel is easily misunderstood and twisted by false teachers. Yeah. What does he mean when he's talking about gullible women and taking over the home? Why does he single the woman there? I don't know of any specific examples. And I actually, if anybody else wants to make a comment on this, I think he's basically just saying that these men had impure motives for ministry. They were doing a lot that they were calling ministry, but their motives were, were wrong. Like um, taking advantage of these women, maybe for their own benefit, for their own profit. I, I don't know exactly what they were doing, but whatever. But he's, I think Paul is just calling out their motives. I don't know if anybody else has any insight in your, in your uh, study. It could be because... He's coming from a patriarchal society. I would say that's definitely part of what's going on here, which is that the only people that would be hosting their men in their homes while their husbands or otherwise would be away would be the women. And so the ones susceptible to influence would be, as a result, the women. But also, historically and definitely in the early church, participation of women in the church was way higher than than men so the again the ones that are most susceptible are just the ones that 
teachers would have access to, which would tend to be women. So hmm. good, good thoughts. Thanks for sharing those. Okay, let's let's keep let's keep moving forward. We might actually be able to read through the whole letter. Ray, can I call on you again? Verses 10 yep. to 17. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue what, in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So if you look at verse 10, Paul lists some characteristics of those who are rightly handling God's word. I think these are worth like just talking about. First of all, we see that their lives are open for all to see, that they teach true doctrine, and that they practice what they preach. Those are three important characteristics of a person who's rightly handling God's word. We all love the, the last two verses in this section. All scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Well, how can we know that the Bible is the inspired word of God? I mean, somebody could say, well, it's a unique book, but that doesn't prove that God inspired it. One, one way to help people see that the Bible is the inspired word of God is to, to consider the fulfilled prophecy in Scripture. For example, there are 332 distinct Old Testament predictions regarding the Messiah which Jesus fulfilled perfectly, such as being born in Bethlehem, his emergence from Egypt, healing the sick, his death on the cross, and so forth. So a professor has calculated the probability of any one man fulfilling just eight of these prophecies would be one to 10 to the 17th power. That many silver dollars would cover the whole state of te Texas two feet deep that probability just for one in eight but if you consider that 48 of those prophecies were fulfilled the odds become 10 to the 157th power so and yet we have 332 prophecies that were in jesus christ that's a good way to help people understand that the bible is the inspired word of god Let's keep going. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Mike, since you got the mic, could you just read those five verses? In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, do her hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. So in chapter 4, we're going to see that Paul says to guard the gospel because the gospel is a timeless message and it's worth dying for. It's a timeless message. It must be spread. He says, preach the word. We, it must be spread. But it's also worth dying for. 
So he continues on in, in verses six to eight. He said, this is what Paul says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will award me on that day. And not only me, but also all who have longed for his appearing. The gospel is worth dying for. By God's grace, I hope that everyone in this room and everyone listening to me finishes well, finishes well. You know, there's about 800 or so leaders mentioned in the Bible, and there are about 100 of those leaders that we kind of know how they ended their life. And do you know that only one third of those leaders mentioned in the Bible finished well, finished their life well? without turning away, without falling away from God. It's hard to finish well. And I think that one of the challenges for us this morning is to finish well. What will it take? How do we finish well? Well, let me give you some ideas to consider. Here's six characteristics of a person who, can, who will finish well. First of all, and this is probably the most important, by maintaining a personal, vibrant relationship with God right up to the end. You know, I hope you, you may have a commitment in your heart that you will do that. Secondly, by keeping a learning posture, learning from all kinds of sources, especially life itself, just to, to, to never stop learning, to never stop growing, to never stop reading this book. You know, when I was 30 years old, I made a commitment to read through the Bible every year for the rest of my life by God's grace. And I do it. I've stuck with it. And every year I read the Bible, I feel like I'm learning something new. I'm seeing something for the first time. It actually kind of blows my mind because it should be so familiar. There are parts that are, but there are so many things that I've yet to learn, yet to understand. I'm still wrestling with the scriptures. So make a goal to, to be a lifelong learner. Third, by manifesting Christ-likeness in your character as evidenced by the fruits of the Spirit. Are the fruits of the Spirit being evident in your life? Fourth, by, by truth that's being lived out in your lives so that your convictions and the promises of God are seen to be real. Living out your faith. Like, we talk about trusting God, but are you really trusting God in your life? Are you really because we can talk about it, but we can just trust in ourselves or trust in our own security. But what are we doing to really trust God, to step out in faith? Fifth, living with a growing awareness of a sense of purpose and destiny. I think one of the things when men retire, there was a statistic I remember hearing years ago that the amount of men that die within six months of retirement is almost staggering. And I don't know if that's true today or not, but I know many years ago it was. Men would retire and they would lose a sense of purpose. And so they had nothing to live for. And so they played golf for six months and then they died. Not that there's anything wrong with golf. I mean, I think it, it, it's true that, you know, but find meaning and purpose. And, you know, I'm so impressed with so many of the men in this room because I know a lot of you are retired. And so many of you men, you have found purpose, you have found meaning, and you are serving God. And I'll tell you what, as a younger man, I think I'm younger than you, but you know, I'm slowly, I love being the young guy in the room, by the way. It's always kind of fun. But, but as a younger man, you guys inspire me because that's how I want to be. I want to finish well. I want to keep serving God all the way up to the day I die. So maintaining a sense of meaning and purpose and destiny. And then the last thing, and this might be the most, second most important from number one to number six, leaving behind a legacy for the next generation. You have the opportunity to leave a legacy for the next generation by discipling them, by mentoring them, by taking a younger guy under your wing, sharing everything you've learned, passing it on, passing it on to your children and your grandchildren. And you know, one of the things I thought about a lot is you know, how Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, and Timothy treasured this letter. Oh, I bet he memorized it. I bet he memorized it. 
And I want to encourage some of you guys to write notes to your children and your grandchildren. Try to leave as much wisdom as you can with them. Like, you know, pass on what you've learned to the next generation. You'll never, ever regret that. I think we have time to kind of finish this off. Let's see. Rex, would you mind re reading this? Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, has go because he loved the world, has deserted me and has gone to... Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent to Caius to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Arpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. I love that verse 18 there. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his kingdom. You know, God had delivered Paul before, so he had no doubt about God's power or goodness. Paul just didn't know if it was his time or fate, would, how his life would end. But he knew that he, was, he had a bright future, that he was going to go into the heavenly kingdom, even if he was executed. This reflects on an unreasonable optimism and joy. Paul faced his last moments of his life. And think about this. He was, by many accounts, penniless, friendless, without valuable possessions, cold, without adequate clothing, and destined for a soon death. Yet especially knowing that the heavenly reward was waiting for him, he would not trade that place with anyone. Wow. I mean, he finished well. He finished well. So there's only a few more verses left. Rex, why don't you finish us off? Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Oniphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Abulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with all. So the last words of Paul reflect a man who simply loved Jesus and had received his grace. This simplicity and all the power that went into it was marked, marked the entire ministry of Paul. So back to what was his final message to Timothy? I think it was to guard the gospel. Guard the gospel. And we need to do that today. We need to guard the gospel because people are trying to twist it. They're trying to just make us like another religion, like all religions are... All religions lead up to the same God? No. No, the gospel is that God came down. It's not us climbing up a mountain. It's, it's God coming down to us. We need to guard the gospel because the gospel is a treasure that's worth losing everything and suffering for. The gospel is the key to real life change. The gospel e is easily misunderstood and twisted by false teachers. And the gospel is a timeless message worth dying for. Any final comments or questions? First of all, I think that was a great presentation. And one of the ways that we guard the gospel is we guard our heart. And I really liked what Paul wrote in beginning of chapter three, where he says, speaking of the end times, people become lovers of themselves, lovers of money, and if your love is disordered, then you cease to love that which you should. Because then he goes on to say, they suddenly become without love. 
And then they're not lovers of the good. They're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then in chapter 4, Paul gives a personal example of this disordered love in uh, verse 10, where he points out Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me. And so, you know, you try to think of what's the practical application of guarding the gospel. I think it starts with everyone here, guard your heart. Make sure that that which you love is true, it's godly, and it's not otherwise disordered. Amen. And one of the ways we guard our hearts is we spend time with him daily. It's our daily devotion. If you stop doing that, the world is going to creep in and start taking over. Other comments, thoughts? Greg, I really like your comment about uh, leaving a legacy. And the older we get, the more we think about that. I have a, a good friend who's a pastor that has six grandchildren, and he works through an entire Bible with all of his notes in the margins, on the bottom, and references. And he's preparing six of those Bibles, one for each of his six grandchildren. The notes that I've kept since I've been teaching for 18 years are in now in three, four inch binders. I will give those to my grandchildren as well. Yeah. That's awesome. That is so, man, that, yeah, that is so meaningful. I hope to do the same thing. Other, other comments, Ray. First of all, we can't share what we don't have. The gospel's key. My daughter works for hospice and she does PR work. So she's going to give a presentation on leaving a legacy. She says, Dad, you got anything that would help me out in that area? I said, yeah, <laughs> let's have lunch. I gave her about six things that were laminated. I says, if I give you something laminated, it's timeless. Okay. My whole life, and I hope it's ours, as we internalize the gospel, is to share it with everyone as long as we're on this planet. And she says, you know, Dad, that really helped me out a lot for that, that talk. So we, then we connected heart to heart because this is the language she was looking for. And I prayed for an opportunity to talk to her, not just from the head. And it was just a wonderful experience. And I know you guys, as we internalize the gospel, will be energized by that. And everything we do will be for him. So, yeah, great message. Thank you, Greg. I want to share a quick story. And actually, Marius might be able to fill me in on the story. Because I work with international students. So I work with people from other religious backgrounds. One of the things I have to consider is when I share the gospel with somebody from, from a different faith background, the implications that that's going to have on them and their family and, and their relationship with their family. And I heard an interesting story, and Marius, maybe you could share this. When Marius and his wife were in the Middle East, and they would lead somebody to faith, quite often that person would be imprisoned, like a few months later. And, you know, and your wife told me a story that she talked to one of the guys after he got out of prison and said, hey, because she felt it's like it was her fault. Like, I shared the gospel with you, and now you're in prison. It's kind of my fault you're in prison. Your life is, like, horrible. And so she's like, I wonder if he regrets that. And what, what's fascinating, time and time again, that person says, no regrets. One of the persons that uh, came to faith ministry spent one year in prison. And afterwards, when he came out, he was very depressed. But the thing that he was depressed about was he told us, he told everybody about Jesus, the prison, prison guards and Al-Qaeda. He told everybody about Jesus, but nobody came to Christ. That was what he was depressed about. But uh, he had so many testimonies about the uh, angels appearing to him and strengthening him. But uh, finally, the, the security police spied on him and finally he decided to, uh, to leave Yemen for, for Egypt. But the day before he left uh, Yemen, he came with a big smile in my house and he said, guess what? He said, I led another Yemeni to the Lord. And he said, if you think I'm an evangelist, he is me on steroids. So, yes, yeah, so once these guys, they pay so much, but once they turn for Christ, they just full out. And if, if you think of, uh, I always think of Jesus. Who was his, his most severe enemies in the, in the gospel? It was the Pharisees. Who did God use the most to write the Bible, the New Testament especially, and spread the gospel? A Pharisee named Paul. 
And for me, it is just amazing how God, Muslims for him and for his glory. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing that. Any other comments or questions? Okay, we got Joe over here. And then I want to, while, while the mic is getting to him, there are some great memory verses in the book of 2 Timothy. I listed a couple here. Some of them are very familiar to you. But man, I cannot even, I, I know as you get older, it's harder and harder to memorize things. But please try to memorize God's word. Try. Don't stop. Keep memorizing verses. There are some great verses worth memorizing in this book. Joe. Yeah, further highlight some of the things that have been said already. We need to be on time in or in a season in reference to the fact that you never know who's going to come into your life and at what time they're going to come into your life and at what point they're going to come into your life. And how you live and how you say things sometimes is more important then, you know, we just have to be ready for that. And it happens every day in my life. And one thing that you have to be also cognizant of is when it says, don't get into quarrelsome arguments. Because sometimes somebody is so one to press their point, and it's happened recently with a, a Muslim that did get in my car, but I didn't fight him. I just let it go. Because it wasn't the time nor the season to introduce that person anymore. They were, they were ready to fight. And sometimes we just have to be quiet. By the way, let me, let me just close with this, and then I'll have somebody close in prayer. One of the illustrations I had in my thing, but I didn't share, was this guy was saying, talking about how, he goes, I don't know about going to church. Like, I mean, I've, I've heard sermons. I've probably heard a thousand sermons but I can't remember a single one of them. What good is it? And he was telling his friends, he was kind of having this argument, like, what's the point? Like, I go to, I go to a service, I hear a sermon, but I, I forget it two days later. I've heard a thousand of them. Well, then the next week, his friend comes back to him. He goes, you know what? I was thinking about what you said. I've eaten a thousand meals, and I can't remember what I had for lunch last week. But those meals have helped me stay healthy and to grow and to progress. That's the value of hearing the word of God. It, it, it is helpful. It is, it will help you grow. It will help you, you know, get to know Jesus. It's just, we don't see it that much. So who could close this in prayer this morning? Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Greg. Just uh, <clears throat> real quick before I pray, uh, in chapter two about, Paul says, you, these things you have heard in him, and been pronounced across the spectrum of many witnesses. And it brought me back to that, uh, that time I was on the field with the Chosen down in Texas when we filmed for the feeding of the 5,000. And people from all 50 states were there, all different churches, 36 different foreign countries, many of them from persecuted areas like East Africa and Asia and, uh, and parts of South America. And they flew halfway across the world to be there with us on that field. And it wasn't necessarily just to be part of that production, but to be there with Christians from all over the world, to share what Paul has shared with us, what you, Greg, have given us this morning, such a great gift from this book, and just, just to see that fleshed out in that moment, and as well as others would have various testimonies here this morning that were just so uplifting to me, to hear and to, and to share in. And, uh, and I just, that key moment, those moments down there really reflected that to me to be even more eager to share the word as Paul commands us here in, in, in Timothy. So thank you. Amen. I'll pray. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe. Lord, for you sustain us, you bring us your word, you bring us love and strength and the power of your, your love, Lord, through your Holy Spirit that speaks to us and has spoken to us this morning and has touched our hearts and moved us, Lord, to the desire to go closer with you, to grow with you, to to put our hands on the plow and move forward with the word to the world around us that is in darkness and hurting and in search of the truth. Thank you for the words of Paul and for, for everyone here this morning that had shared and has given their hearts and testimonies, Lord, as, uh, as Paul is exhorting us in these last days, in the days when there are scoffers and there are mockers, but Lord, now your word is growing stronger. There are revivals taking place in very difficult places. 
And Lord, we pray for that renewal and revival in our own country as well. Lord, that each of us would be an instrument of your peace and your, your strength, your gospel to a world that, Lord, is in such need of salvation and forgiveness and hope and light. And in these things, Lord, we pray, help us to grow in these things. What we've learned this morning, carry it out from these doors into the mission field around us. To the glory of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.